verse 35 is where we're, where we're left off. We're not actually doing every verse of Luke, but we're doing the parables of Luke. And uh, we're asking the question, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does it mean to really follow Jesus? And he gives us all these wonderful parables, these little simple stories that teach us what it means to follow Jesus. And so um, that's where we are again today. Um, picking up where we left off last week in chapter 12 and verse 35. Where we read, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve and will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night and toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? <coughs> and the Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming. And he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. And the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he's not aware of. And he'll cut him to pieces and assign him to a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants, will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Oh, there's a lot there, isn't there? A disciple is one who serves faithfully. Someone who's ready to serve the Lord at all times. You see, we've been learning along the way, first of all, that a disciple is someone who obeys persistently. Their life is characterized by obedience. It doesn't mean that we're perfect or that we never make mistakes. Of course, we all fall down. We all, we all have our problems, for sure. But we're in the process of learning how to obey the commands of Jesus. We learn that to obey Jesus and to follow his, his call and to become a disciple is learning how to love sacrificially. Remember the, the, uh, the story about the Good Samaritan. And then we learned last week that to be a disciple is someone that's learning how to trust God and to trust Him completely. And of course it's a process, isn't it? That's a lifelong process of learning how to trust God. And remember, he gave us the, the story about the guy that built bigger barns, but he didn't really trust in God. He trusted in riches rather than in God, which was his problem. He left God out of his planning, and that's never a good thing to do. Our security is not found in stuff. It's found in God. So this week we learned that a disciple is someone who serves God faithfully. As someone who serves God faithfully. Um, last week we talked about how God uh, provides for our needs and how we can really be trusted. And we looked at some pretty extraordinary examples like R.G. Letourneau and, and uh, who was that? Um, George Mueller and a few others like that, J. Edwin Orr, who trusted God in amazing ways and saw God's provision on a daily, regular basis. And I didn't get a chance to tell any of my stories. And, I mean, I just had too much stuff to talk about. But the truth of the matter is God can be trusted. And I've seen it over and over and over again in my life. 
I could tell you the story about when I needed a car, how God provided me one. And now when that car got to over 200,000 miles, I started praying again, and God gave me another car that lasted for a good long time. Now, he doesn't do that every time, but I've had two occasions where just out of the blue, someone gave me a car. And it was a decent car. It wasn't, well, three times. I forgot about the other one. There have been three times where that's happened. And then I can tell you the story about when... Um, when Malou and I moved to Altadena, or to Pasadena, to work on my doctorate at Fuller, um, how we were struggling to find housing. And, because everything's so expensive. In fact, Fuller's moving because it's so expensive there in Pasadena. In a couple of years, they're going to move to Pomona, I guess. But in any case, um, with, just for a small little apartment, it was just incredibly expensive. And then one day, I got this email out of the blue from a professor who was going on sabbatical and needed someone to take care of his house oh, <laughs> for a year and a half. Oh, wow. He was going to Europe and he was going to be teaching at some various places and spent some time at Cambridge and then in Sweden and then he went to Rome for a while and he was at different places. And actually it turned out to be a couple of years. It was longer than what we originally had agreed to. And we paid less than we would have paid for for our own studio apartment in Pasadena. And we got the best view in Altadena. Up on the top of the hill, from our deck, you could see the whole LA Valley. I could see all the way over to Anaheim. We could see the fireworks from Disneyland at night. And you could see Santa Monica over on this side and everything in between. God blessed us so abundantly and amazingly for several years as I was working on my schooling at Fuller. And it's not the only time it's happened in my life. God really does hear and answer prayer if we trust it. Let me give you one other example. When I was just out of college, this is way back, this is ancient history for some of you, um, back, uh, and, and there were a couple friends that I had. We all kind of had jobs. We we're just trying to get started. We were just fresh out of college. None of us was really making all that much money. And I was working three part time jobs just to kind of get by at the time. And we needed God to give us a place to live in. So, Four of us found a house sitting situation. We got to take, and it was we were taking care of this house for like nine months. Two of them got married and moved on, and there were just two of us left. And then the owners were coming back again, so we had to find something else. We continued to pray about it. God, we need you to provide again. And all of a sudden, we got this call from this doctor out of the blue, we, Dr. Gallagher, and Dr. Gallagher said. I'm looking for someone to take care of my place, and I have a friend who told me that you two have been watching over another house and are looking for someone. And so we went and interviewed with Doc, and we got one of the best views of Minneapolis. We were up on the top of the hill, the highest point in the county. Literally, we had the skyline of Minneapolis out in front of us, and there were four golf courses within a couple miles of where we lived. And we were right by Lake Minnetonka, and one of the biggest and most beautiful lakes in, in Minneapolis. We were just in the best place. And God provided that place for us for several years. Until I moved to Ohio, I had this place to live in. And it was cheap. We didn't have to pay that much. Basically, we took care of most of the utilities, and that's about it. Um, and it was just the blessing of God. So, you know, when you do pray and you trust them, it's amazing what doors God can open for you. I just want to throw those stories into the mix here. Because trusting God completely is the foundation for what we're talking about today, which is that when we really trust God, we're going to want to serve Him faithfully. And it's all part of the same context in this scripture. It's about God opening up the kingdom of God and His resources in our life. And therefore, what should we be doing? We should be good stewards of what we have been given. It all kind of fits together. If you can trust God for things, and you learn to obey Him, it's amazing how He blesses. And uh, as we're faithful with those things He gives us, He opens up other doors of opportunity for us. It's a beautiful principle that Jesus teaches in this scripture. So a disciple is someone who's learning how to serve God faithfully. There's something I'm going to tell you about that house-sitting situation in a minute, but I'm going to wait. 
A disciple is a servant, first and foremost. To follow Jesus means that we become a servant. Now, let, let me not dress that word up too much for you. The word is doulos in Greek, and guess what it means? Slave. That's what it really means. Jesus is our master, and we are his bondservant. We're his slave. That's what Paul called himself in several occasions. And that's what Jesus here describes as our relationship with him. Now, of course, it's much more than that. He also calls us a friend, you know, in other places. We know it's a, it's a close relationship. But in, in the sense that we are to humble ourselves and take a humble position, we're slaves. And he's our master. So at the heart of what it means to follow Jesus is to humble ourselves and to be ready to serve him at a moment's notice. Whenever he has something he wants us to do, we should be at his beck and call. We should be there ready to serve him. Whenever he opens a door of opportunity and makes it clear to us that this is our job, this is what he wants us to do, then we follow. We, we go for it. So he says in verse 35, be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Now, what is he saying here? Now, some of you might have, some other translations say it in a more interesting way. They say, gird up your loins. <laughs> now, sometimes I just kind of like what it's up. And that is more literally what it says in the Greek. Gird up your loins. And it comes from a phrase that's used several times in the Greek version of the Old Testament. The first one is found in when it describes the Passover. And they were getting ready to leave Egypt at any moment. And they were told to gird up their loins. In other words, you take the fabric from, you know, they wore long robes. You take up the fabric and you wrap it around your waist. Because you're going to get out there just as fast as you can when the moment arrives. And you can imagine if you've been in captivity in Egypt and God's beginning to deliver you. And he says, We're gonna, it, can, it could be any moment now. That's girding your loins, okay? <laughs> it's used to several other places in the Old Testament as well. But that's the first use and probably the most, um, probably the one Jesus might even have in mind here. You know, it's the ultimate. If you're going to be delivered, you've got you to be ready for this. And here he's saying our service should be the same way. We should be ready at any given moment to serve the Lord and to be accountable to Him. So he says, like servants waiting for their master's return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. So again, you've got this picture of a, a master who's up, he's at a wedding banquet, and it's late at night, and you don't know when he's going to get back, but you're the head servant, and you're in charge of things. You better be there at the door when he gets home. So get ready, gird up your loins, keep the lamps lit. In other words, I mean, we turned the lights on, but back then they had these oil lamps. And you had to make sure they had the wick trimmed, and you had to make sure they had oil in the thing. And remember, there was another story, that, another parable, we won't look at this one in this series other than right now, and that is the story of the ten virgins. In Matthew 25, it talks about, and I, always, I can't help but think of my good friend Enoch Fakudze, he had a song about this, he was from Swaziland, Africa. And Enoch, he used to play the accordion, and he would say, The ten virgins in the Bible. The ten virgins in the Bible. Five were foolish and five were wise. Five were foolish. Five were wise. He's going to the back of my head, sorry. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was delightful. He was loving it. And you didn't have to hear the accordion part to really music. South African music. It's great stuff. But anyway, that story about the ten virgins is, again, it's another wedding feast story. And there were these virgins who were supposed to go to the wedding party. And five of them were wise, and they filled their lamps up with oil, and they were ready. And so they didn't miss out on the wedding feast. But there were other five, and they forgot to fill up their lamps, and they fell asleep. And guess what? It was too late for them. They didn't get to go to the wedding feast. It's a similar idea here, but here in terms of service. We're to be ready at all times to serve the Lord. This is the essence of what a disciple is there to do. When he says, come follow me, whether it was for Peter and Andrew, or whether it's for you and me, 
We're here to be servants of our Lord Jesus, to follow Him and to do the things that He calls us to do and that He gifts us to do and He gives us the resources to do. Now, we can't do everything, but we can do what He's called us to do and what He's given us the resources to do. And our job as a disciple is to find out what that is. But a disciple is one who girds up their loins and keeps their lamps burning and is ready for the master to come home from the wedding banquet. So be ready for service. Um, okay. So Exodus 20.11 is that text I was talking about. And I even put it, keep your cloak tucked in your belt. So be ready at all times. Keep your lamps burning, even in the middle of the night. Um, all right, so look, we'll just keep moving here. Some people have a gift of service. And some of you might be saying, you know what? I don't have a gift of service, so I don't need to worry about being a servant. <laughs> right? Just like those who say, oh, I don't have the gift of evangelism, so I don't have to be witness. Right? <laughs> All right. That's not how it works. No, there are some of you who are unusually gifted, and there are in this congregation some people who are unusually gifted with service. And whenever you see something that needs to be done, you don't ask any questions. You just do it. That's who you are. It's programmed into your DNA, and God has given you that ability, and there's others of us that's not our gift at all, and we know it. But we're all to have the attitude of service, even if we're not all the gifted ones with the gift of service. Does that make any sense to you? Hopefully it does. Um, some have that God-given ability to serve that goes beyond their natural abilities, but all of us as disciples are called to a life of service for being having a disposition towards serving other people, and especially serving the Lord as He directs us. Now, there's a couple things that ought to be said here. We have seasons of life that impact that, and we want to recognize that. There are some times in life where we get sick, and we have to let other people minister to us. There's some times like when a young mother has children, or her focus is going to be taking care of those kids, and guess what? You're a servant to those kids, right? You're taking care of them. That's a ministry. And you have ministry wherever it is that you work. Or if you're retired, I mean, you're still a steward of what time you have been given. But in any case, we have seasons of life. And in some of them, we have more time or more resources. Or it's more of our gifting than others. And it might be, this is where I fit. And this isn't where I fit. So I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anyone here this morning. I recognize that we're at various points in our walk with God. But at the heart of it, we want to be a humble servant. That's the point that Jesus is trying to get at. And we serve in proportion to what we've been given. Now, some of you aren't given the gift of preaching. And so if I were to come up to you and say, God wants you to serve him next week by preaching the sermon, <laughs> that would be a silly thing, right? You don't try to serve where you aren't gifted. Mm -hmm. To whom much is given, much is required. To whom little is given, those, you know, there's, a lesser, there's a lesser proportion there. So, And God knows who you are. He's going to give you things that fit who you are. Now that doesn't mean He won't challenge you, or He might make you do something that you didn't think you could do, because He sometimes will do that. I didn't used to think I could preach either. But God worked around some things to get me up in front of people, and now they can't get me to stop talking. <laughs> so there we go. A disciple. Secondly, not only is it a servant, he's a steward. There's an interesting little word that's used in this text. Um, and I'm sure you all want to know what the Greek word is. It's a oikonomos. Oikonomos. And it's a word that's translated now as manager, or in some translations, steward. And it comes from the word for household, which is oikos. I thought that was yogurt. Yeah. <laughs> but in any case, you know, it's Greek yogurt, right? But it's also a house or a household. And the person who's in, usually this was a slave or somebody who was under the employ of a master in a household. He was the one who was in charge of everybody else in the household. They call him an oikonomos, in Greek, or a steward. Or a manager is probably the word we would use to describe it. And we would hopefully hire the person 
and not enslave them. But back then, there was no prohibition against that. So they did. But in any case, he was a servant of a household. So, all the, so to a wealthy person, which is what we're talking about here in this particular illustration, he would have an oconomos, somebody who was in charge of all the other workers. He was manager over everybody. And so when the, when, the man, or when the boss left the scene, when the master left, he was in charge. And guess what? When he came home, he was accountable to the boss, right? If they were sloughing off and they weren't doing their job and they didn't do a good job, guess who heard about it first and most? That person who was in charge, as it ought to be. That's the word he uses to describe this, this idea of being a servant here. He's moved beyond just being a doulos. Here, he's talking about someone who is an oikonomos, so the one who's over all the other workers, or all the other slaves. And he's basically telling us that um, a disciple is someone who is always ready to be held accountable. A disciple is a steward, somebody who's been entrusted with responsibility and will be held accountable for what we've been given. Does that make sense to you? So, what I didn't tell you about the story before, the Doc's house. It was a nice house, good view. It was inexpensive. We had a great time living there. But there was one weird quirk to this house. It was that the doctor continued to live there sometimes. There was one room that was his bedroom that we left alone. And there was one room in the basement, which was his storage area, where he kept all the stuff. Now, the, what, what the doc liked to do was he liked to go hunting and fishing. And probably three quarters of the year, almost the whole year, he was gone. But every once in a while, and we never knew when, he would come home. <clears throat> and he'd only be there for a couple days. Or a week, maybe. Or maybe a couple weeks, but never than, longer than a month at the very most. And then he'd be off to Alaska, or he'd be going on a trip to Europe, or he'd be somewhere else. It was an interesting lifestyle. But the thing that I learned in that whole thing is you had to be ready all the time. You always had to have the dishes washed. Because you didn't know. Is he going to come today? I don't know. We don't have any clue. He doesn't going to tell us. He's just going to show up. He had to make sure the, the lawn was mowed and all the bushes were taken care of and everything outside. He had to make sure you didn't have your socks in the middle of the living room. He had to make sure there wasn't a newspaper that was in the wrong spot. You had to make sure that everything was clean and looking good and taken care of. And it was a lifestyle. You had to live in readiness. Because you don't know when he's coming back. And you know that you're accountable for how you have used his house. Now that, my friends, is who we are. Everything we have is on loan from God. And we're ultimately accountable to Him, to how we live our lives, how we spend our money, how we use our time, how do we deal with our relationships, what kind of job do we do on our, our job, how do we use our leisure time. I mean, everything ultimately we're accountable to God for. It's all a gift from Him. And we're going to be held accountable for that someday. So he says, it will be good for those servants who the master finds watching when he comes. Ready. And the point is, and I used to think this when I was a kid, that I have to be ready for Jesus to come back. And I better, he better not catch me doing something then that I ought not to be doing. Right? Now there's some truth to that, but that's not the point. The point is, all the way between now and then, I'm to be ready. I should be watching. Because I'm going to be accountable to him, whether it's at that moment or whether it's in between time, right? We're accountable for the whole thing. Not just the moment when he returns. But he gives us the idea here that Jesus is coming back and we don't know exactly when it is. And we like to speculate about it. We like to talk about it. We like to develop charts to try to determine how it all works together. But, you know... <clears throat> I, I always think of Spurgeon, you know, a great preacher at C.H. Spurgeon. He said, can you explain to me the seven trumpets of Revelation? And, and Spurgeon said, 
No, but I can blow a trumpet in your ear and warn you to, to flee the coming wrath of God. <laughs> I can blow a trumpet in your ear. There you go. Sometimes we get lost in the speculation. But the point is, he's coming back someday. Someday you're going to be accountable to him. And the way we live our life, we want to live with an attitude of a servant. The ability of looking to meet needs that we can legitimately meet. Now, we can't do everything, but there's something that each of us can do. He talks about this thief that comes in the night here. In verse 38, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect it. I always figure that means that every time somebody writes a book and sets a date, that they're wrong, right? And it's true, too, but okay. And then Peter, of course, has this grand question. I love the comic relief of Peter. Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? And do you notice how Jesus answers the question? He doesn't. <laughs> so the answer is yes. Of course, it's for you and for everybody, and it's for us too. We all need to be wise stewards of what we've been given. We don't know when Jesus comes back. So between now and then, I want to live my life so that when I stand before him someday, he's going to say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Because we're all stewards, managers, of hoyamas, if you will. Um... Joel Green in his commentary writes, Disciples are to be the kind of people who are always on the alert. Always on the alert. Always ready. Always waiting. Always looking for ways that we can be of service to Christ. How we can be a servant. And there's an interesting twist in this little passage where he tells us that it will be good for the one who's a good steward because when Jesus comes back, he's going to put on the towel... He's going to come and serve at the banquet. Those who are good stewards. Now that's a fascinating little twist to the story. That Jesus, who's teaching us to be servants, he says, someday I'm coming back. And those who are good servants, who are good stewards, at the great banquet at the end of all time, I'm going to be there to serve them. Isn't that fascinating? This God who comes in human flesh to even serve those who are servants. A disciple is also one who prepares to be a servant leader. And I'll just briefly mention this, but there's a the reason this whole idea of being accountable in this text is that when we're faithful with what we've been given. He'll give us something bigger to be faithful over. And in this context, he talks about how some people take their responsibility and just don't do much with it. And there are others who would take it very responsibly. And there's a blessing that's given to them. Um, well, we read the text, but the, the point is that the servant leader in the kingdom of God, um, the servant leader, authority requires humility. You never lord it over people if you're in a position of authority in the church or in the kingdom of God. And there's some people who aspire to power or authority that should never be anywhere near a position of authority because they're not humble. You're not looking for your own will to be done. You're looking for God's will to be done. You're look, you have to humble yourself to be a leader in the kingdom of God. The first are last and the last to be first. It was a hard lesson for the disciples to get. How many times did Jesus tell them this? And they never seemed to get it. Oh, they're arguing on the road about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And who's, who's going to sit at his right hand. and who's going to... They just never seemed to quite grasp on this idea that, that it's in humility that God exalts people. And so it is in, our, in the church. We ought, ought never to lord it over, to seek power, to abuse power. There's no room for selfishness. These are not the ways of Jesus. The, the leader serves in humility. In the parable, 
The unfaithful steward is the one who abuses power. In the text, he talks about beating the other servants, which is kind of an abuse of power, I would say, right? And obviously, you know, this is a parable. This is a fictional story about truth. But you, the point he's making is he's abusing his situation. He's beating up the other servants instead of caring for them and making sure they're doing the best job that they can do, that we're all fulfilling and responsive. But instead, he's over there beating on them and, and, and lording over it. Um, you see, they forgot to be ready and watchful. They forgot that the master is returning. And that's one of the things that some people do. They lord it over people. They, they take advantage of power. And that is not the way of Jesus. One becomes a leader also by being faithful in the small things. Faithful in handling that which you've been entrusted. In the parable, the unfaithful servant is the one who becomes selfish and lazy. And who takes advantage of the gifts they've been given. In verse 45, we see he's out there getting, he's eating and drinking and getting drunk while everybody else is over there working. He's lazy. He's undisciplined. He's not doing what he ought to be doing. He's selfish and lazy. And therefore, he's the unfaithful servant of the passage. One other thing about the unfaithful servant, he's one who doesn't get ready or doesn't do what the master wants. So at the heart of what it means to be a servant is to do what the master wants, right? It's a simple enough concept, but a little harder to do sometimes. What does Jesus want you to do? What has he gifted you to do? What is your place of service? These are important questions. Ones for which we are held accountable. You see, the faithful servant is ready at all times to do what the master wants. This is his disposition. Just like a good nurse. I don't know, Ian might argue with me on this, but a good nurse, in my opinion, is one who is takes care of the patients that they're watching over, who's ready to serve them. And obviously, there's a lot of things competing for that attention. But, or, you know, in any other thing, you know, the, the success of what we do is one who prioritizes and is ready at all times to do what they have been called to do. Our disposition <coughs> should be a humble servant. And one other last thing just to say is this. It will be good to be a faithful servant. He says it three times. It will be good. <coughs> this is some good news for you here. Because I know this is kind of a tough passage. And sometimes we kind of feel beat up by this passage. But it's really meant to be, in large part, an encouragement to us. To be faithful. And that God will be good to us. It says in verse 37, it will be good for those servants whom the master finds there we go <laughs> watching watching when he comes the tongue stopped working today sorry it will be good <laughs> then verse 38 it will be good for those servants whom the master finds ready even if he comes in the middle of the night and then in verse 42 and or excuse me verse 43 it will be good for the servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns now what's he doing He's the one who's the wise, faithful steward who's in charge of all the master's household and all of his possessions and all of his stuff. So, do you get it? To the faithful servant, the one who humbles himself and does what the master wants, that's in essence what it means, in part, to be a disciple. Just as much as to obey him and to love and to trust, so to serve faithfully. You see, everyone to whom much has been given, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Your talents, your gifts, your resources, your relationships, your time, they're on loan from God. He's the source. And ultimately, they're His. The disciples are learning to live as a faithful servant, steward of what he or she has been given. And you are held accountable for how you've used those things. The unfaithful servant is going to regret their choices. Now, to use the analogy of the text, he gets cut up and beaten. <laughs> That's kind of brutal. I know. Thankfully, it's an illustration. Uh, but it, it's saying something important, isn't it? But the faithful servant and disciple will come to a banquet and be served by Jesus himself. Isn't that great? At the end time banquet, that 
You know, that, that celebration that's a part of our eternal home, there will be Jesus putting on the towel, being the servant, and will be promoted. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've put, been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Some of you think you're going to be sitting in a cloud playing the harp. That's not what the Bible says. It talks about us being a kingdom and priests who serve our God. It talks about how under his authority we will be there ruling. Now you think about what that means. Um, so it's going to be more exciting than most people think when we get to heaven. But the point is, the way we live our life down here is going to impact what you do in the next. Um, there's all kinds of examples of good servants. When I think about you know, somebody that I'd like to emulate in this regard as a servant, I think of Mother Teresa. I just love the way she loves on people and serves people. And she says, faith in action is love. And love in action is service. Isn't that not true? When we, we really have faith, we, we want to love. And when we want to love, then we want to act. And how are we going to do that? By serving people. And for her, it's, it was the poor people of Calcutta. The poorest among the poor. And she said, not all of us can do great things. But we can do small things with great love. Isn't that good? Yes. We can't all do it all. But we all can play a part. The most important thing, and the point of the whole thing, is this. What is your attitude as a disciple? It's to humble ourselves to be a servant. And to listen to his voice. And look to meet the needs that we're able to meet with the resources that he gives. And by the way, if you haven't seen it yet, look on the church Facebook page and see the news story about Kim and Dave Hatfield's ministry. What's that? There's a one I just got this morning. That is the television show that they showed on national TV in uh, Kenya about the, the school that Kim and Dave started and now Hilton's Heroes, how they're expanding the ministry. A beautiful thing on national TV I put it on our church Facebook page. And if I can figure out a way to do it, I'll get it on the church website. But in any case, it's a great, great testimony of being a servant who saw a need in Kenya and decided he needed to do something about it. Our own David King. And praise God for how he's using them for his glory. It's a, that's what it's all about. It's about being a servant, seeing a need, and then doing what you can do in his resources to do something for his glory. Well, let's pray. Lord, um, help us to be servants. Help us to be stewards. Help us to be ready at all times for whatever it is that you want us to do. Help us, Lord, to live in readiness and watchfulness. Because we don't know when you're coming back, or we don't know when this life is over for each one of us. But we want to be ready, and we want to be faithful. So help us, Lord, to know what we should do. Help us each to find our place, and to serve you there, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.